What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Also, Instagram at talklouder underscore podcast. And of course, our website, talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And today, I think Jason and I are still pinching ourselves. Um, we've got rock royalty on the show today. The legendary voice, Mr. Graham Bonnet, is with us today. Uh, he's got a new album out called Day Out in Nowhere. It drops May 13th. Uh, we talk about the new album, and of course, we get into his history a little bit. We only had 30 minutes with him, but I think we covered a lot of ground, and he was very and, gracious with his time. Yeah, that's fine. The, the 30 minutes, I feel like... Uh we're getting pretty good at milking 30 minutes from these bad motherfuckers yeah. that we end up have lucking <laughs> out on. You know, I wanted to say, you know, let's, uh, this is our intro to our Graham Bonnet special, as I should say. <laughs> um, let's, I don't, I don't care if people know this. How did you go about getting Graham on there? Was, were, were you reaching out? Were you, were you pitching, you know, the idea? Did did he come, how did he come across your radar to get him on the show today? Um, he is handled by Freeman Promotions, and right. that's uh, John Freeman, who is a publicist extraordinaire. We've worked with him a number of times, whether oh, you yeah. know it or not. I've worked with him a lot of times over the years. Yeah. Um, and so Graham has a new record coming out called uh, Day Out in Nowhere, and of course the PR machine is rolling. So. Right. I got an email that said he's got a new album. Here it is. He's available for interviews. So, of course, see, uh, see kids, it's all about your connections and using your resources. And that's it. And then, of course, I texted you in a frenzy <laughs> saying, hey, right. man, can we can you make this happen at such and such a time on such and such just, a day? It's freaking Graham Bonnet. And, and my response is usually like, uh, yeah. Yeah, but that's it. Court, There's really check. like, do you have to ask me about, you know? Well, the yeah. thing is, if I book it with the publicist and then set in stone and it's for some reason you can't make it, then we got well, a yeah. problem. Well, so. well, yeah, it's usually not that big of a scheduling nightmare. It's usually not. Well, we're lucky to have him today. Obviously, yeah. everyone knows him from his work in Rainbow, Michael Schenker Group, Alcatraz. He's, um, made he's, done some a of serious, he's made some serious records. Oh, he's yeah. He's made some serious hard rock and roll records. Absolutely. Um, I love how powerful his voice is. And it, the great thing is, is he was, he was uh, awesome to share um, a little bit about how that goes. I mean, even his like uh, surgery he had on his vocal cords and, and then running into the uh, a voice therapist there who asked him, you know, did, what, did he got to talk about his voice and his origins of of god he's been singing his whole life yeah like literally, literally walking talking singing at birth pretty yeah. much um yeah. i never knew that he started so early and that's just sick um that yeah. we got to like really get a lot of insight about it um i think that uh the band that he's working with he's extremely happy to work with um you know, I know I've known the bass player for years, and uh, he's he's lucky to have her in the band because um, she's very talented and been been around the the scene in L.A. a long time. I didn't even realize Graham was living in L.A. so long. Yeah, yeah, like since the '80s. Yeah, he's been yeah. there for quite a while. Yeah, and uh, his bass player Beth Beth Amy, I believe, is her name. No, Beth Amy, Beth Amy Heavenstone. She, Heavenstone, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, she's not only his bass player, but she's his significant other as well. Yes, so, of course. Um, they've been together for a number of years, and obviously they have musical chemistry. And she actually, I believe, co-produced the new album, Day Out in Nowhere. That's what he was saying. So yeah, he was that's mentioning that. it, It's always great, and I can say this because I know this, it's always great to have someone in your band wearing a couple of other hats for management, for producing, for songwriting, you see where I'm going. So yeah. anything like that, which goes back to my comment. It's like, he's got a team. Yeah. And he seems happy as hell. And that's the most important thing because he's been doing it literally his entire life. Yeah. And you know, I'm not, I'm not joking here. He's, he's not 20 years old anymore. Right. Right. And 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 he's been very prolific in recent years. I yes. feel like I'm getting an email like once a year, once every eight months that says he's putting out a new album. He's putting out something new with Alcatraz. He's putting out this. He's putting out that. Uh, so he stays very busy. 
Um, and, and that voice is in amazing shape, uh, even on this new record. At the age of 74, he's still belting it out like crazy. You and I have both seen him live in recent years, and he's still amazing. Um, and, I, you know, as someone who grew up watching those videos on MTV uh, all night long and uh, since you've been gone, the, the videos he did with Rainbow, mm -hmm. classic videos. I mean, just couldn't be more honored to have him on our show today. Just amazing. Graham Bonnet on the Talk Louder podcast. Oh, hey. <laughs> There he is. Hey. Hello. And, yeah, the dog, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the dog wags its tail. <laughs> yeah, th th this dog was doing this yesterday. She kept walking by and uh, everybody saw, had something to say. Well, yeah. I love your dog's tail. But yeah, yeah. anyway. Well, that's okay. <laughs> she Everyone she wants to do that every time I sit down here. Sure. <laughs> anyway. That's all right. right. <laughs> the first flash of, of a dog's butt next to the wonderful <laughs> Graham Bonnet. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for the yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And look, I, I I feel underdressed. You know, I almost wore a tie today because Graham has, you know, exudes yeah, this air. Yeah, you got to wear a tie with me. Graham, yeah, well, he exudes this air of sophistication. I didn't, you know, I felt like maybe I'm going to be underdressed today. Even on his day off, he's wearing a button collar. Right. Right. Look at this guy. Graham outdresses everybody and, all the time. That's, that's part true. of his I do. status. Yeah. Part, yeah, that's part of my gimmick. You know, don't look like the other guys. Okay, I'll, make sure I'll to, do that very make, easily. Rule number yeah. one, make sure to overdress. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Love it. So we we need to talk about your new album. But since we're on the subject of dress, let's let's do things a little out of order. Um, how did you? When did you decide to become the best dressed gentleman in rock and roll? And how did you come up with your look with the the suit and the tie and the sunglasses in a in a genre that's not known for? <laughs> yeah, for, for that kind of right. Dog. Well, it, it, this was uh, way before I was in Rainbow. Uh, I was very much into R&B and old boogie woogie and, you know, 1950s stuff. And um, I was recording completely different music to uh, the way the Rainbow albums turned out. It was lighter and a bit of everything, R&B and whatever. And uh, I decided it was the punk, punk era in, um, in uh, London and everybody's getting their hair sort of cut shorter and stuff. I thought, well, I, I'll do that but I'll go for the 1950s look completely. You know, the suits and the tie and the, everything. And um, I had uh, a guy tailor my shirts as well to be made exactly the way they were in the 1950s. So I really went over the top, you know. And I felt that I had this image, you know, of being whatever, um, you know, James Dean, uh, Marlon Brando, it, that kind of look, you know, right. and I come in my hair back, but I've been coming my hair back for a long time, but I didn't have the suit and tie thing until about 1970, something or other, late seventies. But I thought it was a good look to have because the punk look was happening and, and it wasn't unusual to see people that looked a bit different in the street, you know, so why mm -hmm. not? So yeah. um, there, there was a, actually, there was a little movement going on. I remember at one point where all the guys were dressing like GI uh, people, you know, and, uh, they had a 1950s club somewhere in London. So, you know, all the girls had the, the hoop dresses and all that shit. And so it wasn't that unusual to be 1950s looking. But when I, of course, when I go along to join the band or get, an, get the audition through with, they weren't quite sure what they were looking at, you know. And uh, it was... <laughs> but just, they knew what they were hearing. <laughs> Pardon? I bet they knew what they were hearing, though. Uh, well, <laughs> it was... Yeah, it was sort of... But I, you know, when when I got the job, I thought, well, it's um, that can't be so because I'm so different looking from from them, and I wasn't sure about the Rainbow music or Deep Purple. I, I didn't really know much about Rainbow at all mm -hmm. until I bought some uh, albums with Ronnie singing, Ronnie Theo, and because I had to learn a song or two that um, they played. And but my audition piece was um, mistreated. I think that's a Deep mm -hmm. Purple song. Yeah. So that was my audition song. And uh, I sang it at them, looking like, uh, as Cozy called me, uh, a bank manager. Right. <laughs> Here comes the bank manager. Hello. <laughs> you know, it, it always taken the piss out of me. But, you know, that was all right because it was all done in fun. But when I sang this song at them off microphone because I didn't want to cock it up, you know, fuck it up. And um, they said, why are you singing off mic? Well, I don't want to if I make a wrong note, you know, if I crack or something. They said, no, but the thing is, you're singing off mic, but we can hear you. 
<laughs> and so, right. So that was where the, ah, I see. So uh, that's where they realized my voice is pretty strong. That's one, the the things, job, you know? that's one of the things, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's one of the things I admire about your voice is that your, your projection is, you, you're huge. You're a mega, you're a bullhorn. It's, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's uh, not a lot of singers have that. You know, there's a lot of singers that sing only as loud as they speak. I feel yeah. like, uh, well, you have a loud speaking voice too. That's yeah, I that do. Makes, yeah, it makes sense to uh, me. So I think that uh, I, I think I contribute that to my my granddad. I have huge lungs, mm. and um, I'm sort of straight like a greyhound. So my lungs are big, and my hips, my waist, I should say, is small. So right. you know, I got my granddad's lungs, and I have <laughs> a good. little bit. Of, Yes, so that helps a lot. And a little bit of my mum's singing voice, a little bit of that too, because uh, she was she used to sing a lot, you know, uh, not professionally, but uh, Christmas parties or whatever, and yeah. uh, bless her heart. And she was really my, sort of my inspiration to start singing when I was about seven is when I really started uh, singing on stage. And um, it's um, I used to walk around the house when I was about seven or eight, singing along with... Uh, Mario Lanza, because on the radio we got a lot of opera, you know, and it wasn't rock music until Buddy Holly came along and uh, mm -hmm. Little Richard. But it was all the operatic stuff, and I'd be walking on this little kid going, Whoa, you know, doing, singing these things with a big voice. And my mum and dad thought how funny that was, and I thought I'm amusing my mum and dad. I'll keep this up. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to keep doing that, this is a good one. So I kept on, you know, singing and singing, and I think that through the years I developed and it's got. It, more strength than ever. Even now, it's stronger than it was like, you know, last week or something. Sure. Yeah. You know, if you, you keep a, using that for certain muscle, you, it will, you know, like any muscle, it will build and you'll get stronger. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and you have a, a new album coming out May 13th called Day Out in Nowhere. And uh, there's a song on there that stands out to me, speaking of the power of your voice, there's a song on there called 12 Steps to Heaven. And mm -hmm. I find your voice to be incredibly strong for, and, and and I don't mean to bring up your age, but it's no secret. <laughs> People can look it up. You're 74 years old and you are belting that song mm -hmm. like you did all the way back in the rainbow days. It's phenomenal. So is there any secret to keeping that voice in shape or do you just keep singing like you say and keep flexing that muscle? <laughs> oh no, I don't do anything. I'm, I'm really sort of rough on myself with my voice. I never rehearse. Well, I do rehearse when we actually do rehearsals. We haven't done that for a couple of years, but we're going out on the road soon. But there's no, um, there's no, not really anything I do. I do all the wrong things. I drink coffee. Uh, I don't drink uh, booze anymore. Um, I don't smoke. I'm just very lucky to have the voice of probably a bit of my mom and a bit of Mario Lanza, a bit of opera singing. But what happened a few years ago, about seven years ago, I went to the throat specialist because I was getting a bit of a tickle in there when I was singing in the lower register. Uh, I've got that growly thing going on, and it made me cough, <clears throat> like I'm doing now. It would make me cough during a song. So I went to see him, and uh, he said, well, one of your vocal cords is just about collapsed, your right vocal cord. Mm. He said, the muscle is not working properly. And so what he did, I have to go under, you know, it was uh, – uh, I put cortisone into my right vocal cord. That mm -hmm. one was collapsed. And it brought it back to where it was when I was about 30, I'd imagine, when I was in Rainbow. Wow. I was in my 30s then. And it, I am just uh, amazed at how good it is now. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying it's better now than, you know, 10 years ago. It's, yeah. it's so funny. But I don't really do anything to look after it. And once in a while, I walk around the house singing with a silly voice, a loud voice, but not very often. <laughs> but when, it, when we start rehearsing, that's when I've got to, uh, you know, be serious. Yeah. And I have allowed, I went, uh, when I went to my speech therapist, by the way, there was a, 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 a my voice guy, I should say, the, uh, the guy that did my throat, that did my throat in. There was a speech therapist there. I, I got myself mixed up there. And she said, why do you speak so loudly? I said, I don't know. What, what, what's up with that? She said, you should hold it back a bit. She said, you're, you're wearing your voice out but mm -hmm. because you speak so loud. Yeah. I, I didn't realize I was speaking so loud. But I think the reason is I speak so loud because I'm slightly deaf. You know? <laughs> so I'm losing yeah. my hearing. <laughs> so I'm speaking louder so I can hear myself. 
you know. Right. Yeah. So right. My, both of my ears are going for a bit of a problem. I have tinnitus and my right ear is a little dead. So I hear, you know, in this yeah. ear. So it's, um, it could be, that's why I have a loud speaking voice. I'm just like the dog in. Sure. Yeah. Please, yeah. our special guest star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the the but album so, the, the album's yeah. called Day Out in Nowhere, and and uh, I've been listening to it, and I and I dare say I detect a thread of humor throughout the record. There's a song on there called uh, David's Mom, a song called It's Just a Freaking Song, <laughs> another one called When We're Asleep. Uh, yeah. Let's start with David's mom. Tell us, it, it was David and his mom, are those real people from your life story? Or how did that come yeah. about? Tell us the story. Yes, they are, yeah. I, this happened when I was probably about um, seven or eight. And uh, my friend David lived just a couple of blocks away from where I was. And I go over and call on him to go out to play, you know. And uh, we were, wanted to go into the town that day. And uh, I went over to, I knocked on his door, went in. And his mom was there. She said, what are you boys going to be doing? I said, we're going to go downtown. And she said, well, wait a minute. I'll uh, get dressed and um, I'll take you in the car. It's, you know, it's not very far. It took me 10 minutes to drive you downtown. And uh, she went out of the room and she was, I, I remember to, I told my, <laughs> told everybody about this. She came back into the room where a black, she had this black dress. I'll never forget this. And I'm this seven-year-old kid sitting there and just looking at her. And the, over this chair in the corner was a coal fire and a pair of black stockings hanging over them. And uh, they were warming up for some reason. And she comes in and um, she said, just hang on a minute. And she starts, she pulls her dress up and starts putting these things on, you know, the garter and all that was. And I got a strange feeling mm. and I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I just I felt very uncomfortable at the same time same time very happy sure. <laughs> uncomfortably happy it was <laughs> it was the strangest thing and um I didn't know what it was but now I, of course it was my first sort of sexual experience I guess something in my brain was going yes you like this don't you yeah you like mm. it but I didn't know what and uh, so that is a true story that's exactly what happened wow. and the, the the words in the song tell the story yes you know yeah, you know, <laughs> they do. I, I'll never forget David's mom. Is the chorus that that day I'll never forget David's mom. And tell uh, us about I, I tell us. She died. She tell died us. recently at the age of ninety-two. Oh, wow. yeah. Wow. Well, I showed I showed her picture to Bethany, and she said she looks like a really fun person. She was. She was great. Awesome. But uh, I think she knew. She was making me twinge a little bit when she put her stockings on. Yeah, she was looking at me as as, as she was doing. It. She faced me and was talking to me. You know what I mean? I'm going. Well, yeah. uh, should I look away? But I didn't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that's because you're, that's a, you're a smart man, Grant. Yeah. And what a nice tribute. Um, you know, all these years yeah. later to, to to keep it immortalized in song. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I, I, I could also say that's really sweet of you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> tell, us, tell us quickly about uh, the other song. It's called, the title is, It's Just a Frickin' Song. And I think Jason <laughs> Jason might be able to relate to this because Jason himself is a vocalist, a hard rock oh, singer. There you go. Okay. So, yeah. so tell us, yeah. Yeah, I've just, I've just told the story to another guy. Um, well, I'm sitting there, you know, Don, Don Airy, the keyboard player of Fame and Fortune, yes. he um, sent me a track to put on the album. So that's, Don's uh, arrangement on there. And I'm going, I've uh, got my book out, and I think, well, what the hell can I write this about? You know, because I'd already written like seven songs, and I was getting a bit sort of blank, you know, you got that, what do you call it, writer's blank or whatever it is. Right. And um, I'm sitting there, look at the paper, and I'm saying to myself, well, it's just a fucking song. It's just a fucking song. What can I write you about? It's just the fucking song. So <laughs> that's what it's about. But uh, Conrad, our guitar player, so we, I think, it, you know, sort of, don't say fucking, say freaking. So it's just a freaking song. We say it was the same thing. So right. that's what it's about. It's about writing a song and the frustrations that go into it. And like when, when I say at the end somewhere, um, you know, the song, the song is only three minutes long or four minutes long. But it's all like a month to write. <laughs> so it took me all that time to write the bloody thing. And the yeah. song's three minutes long. It's like, God, 
But that's what it's about, the frustrations of songwriting. It sounds like a good way to get over your writer's block is to just realize what it is you're saying or complaining about. It's like, what the fuck am I going to do here? It's just a fucking yeah. song. Just spit it like Kind of looking, looking outward and looking inward, just kind of catching where you are and putting it on, on paper, if you will, or however you write. I wanted to ask you, um, we were, I was, we were very, but again, we are extremely honored to have you today, sir. Yes. Oh. And we were talking, well, you. of course, we were talking and I wanted to ask you, what is, what is your muse? And you've kind of answered that. You've been, Dave's been asking good questions about his mom. I'm sorry, Dave's not mom. My, not my mom. <laughs> right, not your mom, but Dave's mom, uh, et cetera. And you, uh, uh, how do you, uh, what are you, um, let's say you don't have writer's block. Do you have like... Uh, a thesaurus you go to? Do you have a, a stack of phrases? Do you do you read? Do you take a walk and just think about you know clear your head and come back and yeah. write? How do you and and uh, on top of that lyrically on top of that uh, w your melodies? How do the, do those come to you? Are they inspired by the guitar riff, by the piano, by the you know just yeah? yeah make your own answer out of what I just asked. I've got no idea what you say. Well, wow. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's yeah. usually me that makes it. I'm, I'm all fumbly and all over the place. No, I, what I do is, again, that's, I think it's in the song I wrote the line, I have the t TV turned up really loud or something. Maybe I'm watching TV. And sometimes something on TV will catch my, my ear. You know, go, yeah. oh, what did that guy say? Oh, that's yeah. great, you know. Yeah. And, and something will come out of that. And other times, when I when I, I haven't ridden my bike for a couple of years, but when I go out riding on my bicycle, um, I see things out there because you get out and riding for uh, I usually ride for about an hour and forty five minutes. You see things that spark spark a, an idea in your head, like a signpost, a billboard, yeah, you know, anything like that. But so uh, it is sometimes hard to to really think what a song can be about because I've written about everything, I think, you know. Yeah. That's when you start going into fantasy and, you know, making stories about, you know, swords and dragons and whatever's. And that's not what I, where I come from. I like to write about real real stuff. I have, and sometimes I have, that's a bit harder. I have one more question. It's good to know that I, you know, because uh, I, I write the same way. I'm, I'm, I have stacks of phrases that I, I've gotten yeah. on TV or out of a book or a news yeah. article or whatever. So it's good to know that that's, I'm doing something right. So uh, I wanted to just ask you, I, I really, really love, I mean really love, I'm obsessed with your work on Assault Attack, Michael Schenker Group. And I really love what, what, you're, what you've done. And um, first off, I just want to double make sure you wrote all the lyrics for that record yeah 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 desert song where where what inspired that that sort of story uh, uh yeah where, well where I, I tell you nothing inspired that it's, it's a one that came out of nowhere we huh. were in rehearsal and um michael was playing the riff to that and they, the band was getting that song together musically huh. and i i just look i thought god i said to mike what the hell can i write this about you know and he said, whatever you like, Greg, just, just go with it. And I started writing. I'm sitting on this wooden bench, I remember, in the rehearsal room. And uh, it just, just these words came to me. I don't know why. We're sailing ships across the desert. Yeah. What the fuck does that mean? Well, we're on camels. Yeah, right. Uh, and something, something, in the Arabian sun, yeah. uh, your stallion stands to watch the sun. So it's about a tribe in, you know, a tribe in the desert, if you will. Sure or some people in the desert, probably yeah. me in the desert, whatever. And it just came from nowhere. And as I wrote each line, the, the next one seemed to come much easier. Okay. Because, you know, we're sailing ships across the desert. You know, th then the next line came, which I can't think of now. <laughs> but it came because I, it was telling a story, you know. And, um, you know, uh, to, buy, to, find a, to find a mirage, cool oasis, to lie beneath the the stars in the sky or something, a sand in the well, sky. What you, the, I forget you, what rhyme, you rhyme camels and the camels run with sun. You rhyme that. That's, yeah. Yeah, you rhyme that. Uh, anyway, the rhyme schemes are great. It's it's a fantastic song, and I love, love the riff. And I feel like even Ingve 
sort of like borrowed that riff later on. Yeah, you know, I, I think he did too on some. Yeah. I can't remember what song, but yeah, it was very Michael Chankerish, you know. Yes, yeah, and, well, it's, um, al- it's almost a, he lifted. Ingve almost lifted it entirely. I thought, but anyway, yeah, m- maybe I can't yeah. think which song you mean though. Uh, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, matter. Speaking of these guitar players, a lot of people uh, point to Ozzy Osbourne as a, as a vocalist who surrounded himself with great guitarists throughout his career. But you've, yeah. I mean, you're right there with him. I mean, Shanker, Malmsteen, Steve Vai, Richie Blackmore, Joe Stump, Chris and Pelletieri, the list goes on and on. Tofola. Um, you're, you're, I'm sorry. Joey Tofola. Yeah. And, and, Joey and, your, current, hey, yeah. Joey. and your current hey, guy, Conrad. But so why why was the Rainbow and the Michael Schenker stuff specifically? Why was that so short lived? Well, with Rainbow, well, with Rainbow, I left. I left the band after we did the Masters of Rock uh, show in England, Castle Donita, all mm-hmm. those years ago, mm-hmm. in nineteen eighty. Well, what happened? Well, what sort of sparked my my leaving was Cozy left. Cozy mm-hmm. Powell left the band and. Uh, he was very close to me, and I was very close to him. And mm-hmm. uh, we were really, really good friends. And when he left, and we went into rehearsal, we, we were going to rehearsal, um, we went to Copenhagen, but I, I didn't want to go. And um, I decided, after we did get to Copenhagen, and nothing was happening, nobody was writing any songs, nobody was really at rehearsal, and concentrating on the next album. But there'd be Richie in there one day, and no drummer. We had a new drummer, Bobby Rondinelli. Mm-hmm. And then another day, Roger wouldn't be there playing his bass. And it seemed to me like the band was dying in front of my eyes. And so I came back to, uh, to LA because Don said to me one day, he said, I, I, it's not the same. I, I'm not, I don't want to do this anymore. He said, I want to go back home. I said, well, if you leave, I'm going to fucking leave too, you know. Yeah. And so he, he didn't leave, but I did. I went back to LA and Don stayed which I should have done really, not thinking about it now, all too late. But, um, you know, I went back and uh, uh, Bruce Payne, the manager, called me up and he said, you're leaving leaving the band, Graham. I said, yeah, yeah, there's nothing happening. He said, well, we've got some songs happening now. They're they're working hard. How about if if we get another singer to sing the songs you don't like and you sing the other songs you do like? I'm going, what? Two singers? No, I said, no. Yeah. I, I didn't fancy that somehow. It didn't seem right to me to have oh. two singers in a band. I don't know why, but I didn't really feel comfortable and, and having that as a job. It would always be like a, a competition between this singer and this singer, but, you know, whatever. I, I didn't think it was a, a right move. So yeah. I didn't come back to um, Copenhagen. I stayed in L.A. and eventually put my own band together. So what happened with you and Michael Shanker after that one, after uh, Assault Attack? Oh, nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, I I'm inspired. <laughs> On what ground? Oh, you don't know. You don't know the story, though, I guess. I want to hear it from you. <laughs> oh, bollocks! Yeah, well, if, um, if you're comfortable telling it. Yeah. yeah oh, fuck. I, I mean, it's in the Guinness Book of Records. Huh? Um, <laughs> it must be a doozy. Um, well. <clears throat> What happened on that day? We were playing in Sheffield at the Sheffield University or something like that. And um, I'd been out um, all afternoon with uh, White Snake, who were my friends, uh, with Mickey Moody, etc., all of them. And uh, we were drinking in the pub, blah, 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 getting really fucking drunk. And um, I, came, I, I went back to the... Hey? No, go ahead. That, that wasn't us. That wasn't us. Who oh, was that? Oh, that was you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's, yes, Bethany mucking around over there. And uh, anyway, I, I had to I run out. I had to go get my wallet from the theater where we were playing. And um, I knocked on the door because it was locked. I thought, who's in there? And Michael, Michael Schenker was in there. And he said, no, fuck off, I'm sleeping. And I'm going, Michael, I need my money. My money's in my jacket. It's hanging up. Can you get it for me? No, fuck off. Uh, oh, all right, you know, wow. nice guy. So I don't know if he was drunk <laughs> as well. So I ended up going back to the pub, <laughs> going back to the fucking pub and drinking again with these guys. And they, they bought all the drinks, obviously, because I said I couldn't get my wallet out, out of my dressing room. And um, so it came to time for the uh, show. By this time, I could hardly fucking walk. 
you know. Mm. And on the, my, on the stage were all the lyrics I had to the old uh, Michael Shanker albums and the new Michael Shanker albums, the Assault Attack lyrics. They were all written on paper and we had mon floor monitors and the audience pushed forward and all my lyrics went, oh. see ya, goodbye. They all crinkled up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's, a spinal, that's a spinal tap moment uh, I mean, yes, yeah, absolutely yeah um, i remember ian gillen told a story where they had smoke come on the stage and he had the same thing i <laughs> did the same thing anyway they, the audience came forward when when before we had in ears uh, all the monitors came forward crushed all these papers with songs i didn't know at all <laughs> were, were gone you know and um at this point, I was getting very angry, and my zipper broke on my jeans. Oh. And this is where the big thing came out. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so the, rim chop the, the zipper broke <laughs> yeah. on these cheap jeans I bought, uh, like, the day before, where they made jeans in one hour in Oxford Street in London. Mm. And so the zipper was really weak, and the material. But they're like denim-looking jeans, you know. But anyway, the, the zipper broke. And out comes my, you know, my penis. Mm. I don't wear underwear, so you know it's waving in the wind. And I was, the audience were like crushing more paper and coming forward, going, hey, hey, you know, making a noise. And I started, uh, you know, I started swearing at them. I said, "You fucking bad, get back, you fucking cunts!" Don't you, you know? I started swearing like crazy, and um, I was gone. I eventually left the stage, and they, <laughs> they, they carried on without me doing all the songs instrumentally. And uh, one of our roadies put me in a cab back to the hotel. And uh, he said, they're going to fucking kill you. You better get out of here by, you know, by tomorrow morning. Otherwise, you'll be dead, you know. <laughs> so I got in, uh, in, the, in on a train back to uh, London. And my manager met me there. And um, he said, uh, they fired you, Graham. I thought, oh, that's a, what a shock, you yeah. know. I, I said, <laughs> but I said, I can do it, David. I said, I, I can do it. I'm okay. I just got too fucking drunk with the other guys. I blamed it on them, you know. Yeah. I said, well, I know you can do it, but they don't think you can, mm, you know. It was wow. a big show headlining, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Wow. So um, that was the end of that. That was my uh, demise in that band. But I know we got to let you. I, want, I know we got to let you go, but I want to ask one more question. If you could give us a quick answer, uh, a lot of people out there may not know that uh, your start in the music business is connected to the Bee Gees. Is yeah. that right? Can you tell us Absolutely. real quick before you have to go? Yeah, yeah. Well, my cousin, my cousin Trevor lives in Australia. And the Bee Gees lived in Australia, as you know, when, when they were younger. He was in the band. They made records together. It was called Trevor Gordon, my cousin, and the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees moved to England. Uh, my cousin Trevor stayed in Australia. But I got in touch with my cousin in Australia and asked him to come and live in England so we could make a band together. We put the band together. We... We went to play a gig in London, a real nice club, a lovely club. And um, in the audience was the Bee Gees ex-manager. And he comes up to Trevor after we finished playing and said, Trevor, I think Barry, Robin and Morris would like to hear from you. Here's Barry's telephone number. Gave him that. And so my cousin goes along to see the, the boys, the Gibb brothers, in, in this house. And uh, then my cousin says to Barry, my cousin sings too. You know, he's a singer also. So next day or so, uh, he took me along to meet the Bee Gees. And we were singing in the in their living room, you know, uh, all kinds of different songs, you know, Stevie Wonder songs and bloody Beach Boys and Beatles and whatever, anything. But with this great harmony, I was, like, Ooh. I was in heaven with these guys singing harmony. Wow. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And so suddenly in, in the room comes Robert Stigwood, their manager, and says to Barry Gibb, uh, do you have a song for these boys, Barry? It's, uh, uh, Barry says, uh, no, but I can make one up. And uh, so in a couple of days, he made this song up, which was to become a song called Only One Woman. And uh, it did really great for my cousin and I. We were in the British charts at number three within a short time, wow. on top of the pops all the time and stuff like that. And that was my very first experience of being a professional musician. It was uh, yeah. incredible. It, it was, uh, if it wasn't for the Bee Gees, I wouldn't be here. Wow. Yeah. What was they the name of you? What was the name of you and your cousin's group? The we called the Marbles. Yeah. Marbles. Marbles. Our choice. That was um Robert Stigwood's choice. He went through a lot of different names, 
one being a gravy train. And all the guys said, oh, no, no. Because the, boy, the boys were there too, the Gibb brothers. They go, no, no, no. Yeah. And Barry came up with a name. I can't remember where it was now. But anyway, what about something? He suddenly says, uh, what about the Marvels? No, no, no. Then Barry says, what about the Marvels? Barry said it. What about the Marbles? With the, no, instead of being a B, be a B. And I thought, oh, fuck, that's horrible. But it's Barry Gibb. What can I, I can't say yeah. it. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, <took> it. <laughs> so that, that was our name. And that's, uh, that's what we were called. And when we got to be known as the Marbles all over Europe, especially, but never here. We never had our records released here that's in the fantastic. state, which is a shame because well, I think they were good. We uh, well, we appreciate you hanging with us. Yeah, today. absolutely. I just want to get this out one more time. I, I love your voice and I always have. And Thank I you. really hope great things for your new record. Thank yeah. you. Well, we, I've got a great team behind me. I've got a great band. Bethany's sitting here. She's our bass player. Conrado Pesonado is our guitar player. These awesome. are the guys I started working with, oh, God, about 10 years ago. We were going to put a band together and call it Alcatraz. No, whatever. But yeah. uh, the Alcatraz called me in. That was a big mistake. But anyway, <laughs> I've got people I like working with, people I love. And uh, we Perfect. made a pretty good album, I think. You know, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, Perfect. Conrad and Bethany did a great uh, production on this. You know, they worked hard on this, and I'm so grateful that I've done something that I really can listen to over and over again without going, "Oh, that's so without cringing. You know what yeah. I mean? Oh yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks to them, and thanks to all the our guest players. You know, absolutely. You can ask for better. You know. Yeah, and the album again is called Day Out in Nowhere. It comes out May 13th. Uh, yeah. Graham Bonnet is with us today on the Talk Louder podcast. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave Glessner, thanking our very esteemed and special guest, Mr. Graham Bonnet. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the All Talk right, Louder thank podcast. you. Guys. Thank you very much. See thank you again. Sir. Okay. Wow. That he was, was awesome. Man. Yeah, he, was, he was fun. He's a talker and he stayed with us a few extra minutes. What a great guy. He was fun. I he um was fun. <clears throat> I got to play a show with him. Uh he went on right before Dangerous Toys at this big thing at the bomb factory uh in Dallas mm -hmm. God, five years ago or something like that. Wow. And he was amazing. He played all the hits, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I saw him recently a few times. I saw him at that Michael Schenker Fest that were the photo I sent you. And then I saw him a couple years, probably about five years ago. It might have been the same tour you're talking about. He was in San Antonio on this bill that included L.A. Guns and Ace yeah. Frehley. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Ace Frehley was on the uh, on that. It was a hair metal holiday. It was that's Christmas it. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. right. Yeah. Toys and he done, sounded huh? great, man. Yeah, was, the toys have done a few of those and... And those are fun. Those are great. And Ace and uh, we were between we were between Graham and Ace. I think there might have been Slaughter or something. I think Dawkin was on the San Antonio date. Yeah, Slaughter or Dawkin, one of those. Yeah, one yeah. of those bands I didn't really care a whole lot about. I was just happy to be uh, in the know, same room with Graham Bonnet, san sandwich <laughs> right up next to Graham Bonnet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, and I know I know Bethany. Uh, she was the bass player on I guess for lack of better terminology, uh, Sunset Strip band back in the '80s, called Hardly Dangerous. And I think Athena, Tommy Lee's sister, was the drummer. Oh wow! Yeah. So that's how long I've known Bethany. So wow! I wanted yeah, to get around cool. to asking about her, uh, but uh, Graham was you know he he was. He was taking a long time with his answers, but they were so good. You didn't dare cut them off. And so I was looking at my list of questions going, okay, skip that one, skip that one, skip that one. <laughs> because his, his stories were so great, you know? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I figured, you know, we, we got to get to the guitar players. We got to talk about the new album, you know. Well, um, this is, this should all be our intro. Yeah. 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 <laughs>